welcome back. I hope you all enjoyed your lunch break. Um, as I explained a little before the lunch break, for those who weren't here yet, I, um, I am a little bridge troll in my spare time, so I gave you a riddle, a little riddle. Um, the riddle was, I can fly without wings, cry without eyes, wherever I go, darkness follows me. What am I? Yeah, you wanna go? A cloud, yes, you're right. 10 points for you. A cloud, very well. Um, not sure what you get with enough points, but it's good for your ego. Anyway, back to why we're all here. Uh, this afternoon we'll have a focus on educating in times of transitions. Our keynote speaker now is Joy Ji, a design researcher, author, and designer in the areas of design and social innovation, uh, surface design and interaction design. She's a professor of design and social innovation at the Northumbria School of Design and co-founded the Designing Social Innovation in Asia Pacific Network and also co-founded the inaugural Research Through Design or RTD conference. And today she'll talk to us about supporting transitions towards more equitable, sustainable and fair Futures. Please give her a very warm welcome, Joy Z. Thank you, Jillian. Thank you for the uh, introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's it's always really good to get the post lunch slot because you know the challenge is to try to keep everyone awake. So I hope. I will do that. Um, so uh, thank you for the invitation for the conference to come. It's been a really invigorating and interesting last two days. So, um, and I wanted to share today how we might be designing uh, systemic design in a respectful, sensitive, and with care manner. Before I start, um, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands, skies, and waters where participants are located, and we give respects to all First Nations members who are joining in today. And I also would like to acknowledge the ancestors and elders in my adopted country in Newcastle upon Tyne in England, and also my native country in Malaysia. I'm gonna to try to read from a script so I don't overrun and have time in, in, uh, for questions. But I believe we're gathered in the space because we believe design has immense power to contribute to systemic change. But also I think we've heard some critical voices and challenges and questions. And I also, I think, you know, design has immense power to cause systemic harm as well. So here's an example. So uh, this is Jeremy Bentham's infamous 18th century panopticon prison design. It was created with an inbuilt system of control. So the architecture consists of a rotunda with a central structure in the middle that acts as an observation point for guards. The design means that prisoners can be observed by a prison guard without knowing whether they're being observed or not. And the fact that the prisoners are not able to see that they're being observed means they're, they're more likely to be on their best behavior. So one can argue that this is a very efficient form of design. It reduces the number of prison guards required to um, you know, look at the prisons, but also it has incorporates some behavior change that we talked about in some of the workshops in, in order to encourage self-regulatory behavior. And it's been particularly, uh, you know, it's been criticized in a number of ways, but Michel Foucault, a French philosopher, talks about and uses the concept um, as the ultimate goal to induce in the inmates a state of conscious visibility. In a way, it's a form of psychological manipulation. Prisoners don't know when or where they are actually watched. And for Foucault, this form of incarceration is a cruel and ingenious cage. Although the panopticon concept was never really widely implemented in its physical form, there are some still, still around. Uh, I think they've been closing. Its ideas and principles have had a long-lasting impact on discussions on surveillance, power, and control. In fact, the workshop that was in in the morning around AI and where data is and who has control was really relevant. And it highlights the danger of pervasive surveillance, erosion of privacy, the potential for abuse of power and the psychological effects of constant observation. 
Another more recent example comes from uh, a really interesting book by Caroline Criado Perez book called Invisible Women. I'm sure some of you have read it, where she highlights examples of data bias in the world designed for men. So men are more likely than women to be involved in a car crash, but women are 47% more likely to suffer from serious injury than a man and 17% more likely to die. And this image here illustrates you know, some of the reasons because seat belts and airbags in cars are really designed for the normative male body. Certainly I'm not, I'm particularly small as well, so I have to sit very far in front. And so it really shows that it doesn't account for different body shapes, the design of these airbags and seat belts, and thereby increasing the risk of serious injury to women. Now I know, and we talked about unintended consequences for design um, in some previous sessions in the keynote, and really the, but the question I really want to ask is, how might we better understand the complexity of the systems that we are designing for, and what, and more, more importantly as designers, what can be done to ensure that we do not intentionally design these systems of harm? And here I want to introduce this uh, concept of infrastructures. It's uh, to think of systems as infrastructures. And it consists of social material uh, elements. So for example, at the city scale, you have physical and material infrastructures that could be roads, bridges, uh, telecommunications, etc. You also have social elements of the infrastructure, which is people, cultures, uh, practices, values, processes and protocols and rules. And system theorist Susan Lee Starr and her colleagues Karen Rutler first introduced this idea of infrastructures and they defined them as made up of continually renewing complex uh, social material relationships. So they see these different elements as interconnected relationships between physical, material, and social infrastructures, which are not static, but are always in flux and responsive to the conditions that make and revise them. And again, in the, in the panel discussion this morning, we talked about relationality, how things are always in context. Example, jazz is example of Pharaoh. So again, it's important that these infrastructures have um, pre-existing it's important to point out, sorry, that infrastructures have pre-existing bases. We call them installed bases. Star explains that infrastructure does not grow de novo. It wrestles with inertia of the installed base and it inherits strengths as well as limitations from that base. So therefore, as designers, it's really important to know what that installed base consists of prior to intervening in design. And of course, danger in intervening without prior knowledge means that it, you can potentially disrupt that social cultural fabric. At this point, I want to say that infrastructure as a theory, as a concept, is not the only way to think about systems. We've heard many different ways to do that. Um, however, I found it personally really helpful for me to think about it as a designer or as a design researcher because it has qualities of embeddedness transparency, reach, and is also premised on the existing base um, that has relational qualities, and that resonates with my sensibility. Now, I would like at this point to share an example um, from a Cam Cambodia, which brings out the importance of understanding and acknowledging pre-existing infrastructure of place and context. And this example is not my own, it's shared by a colleague working in international development. So this is a program supported by a local Buddhist uh, community development NGO who wanted to, to explore the role of social enterprise in communities. So workshop was held with villages of Kampung Cham Town, which you can see in the slides, and it sits on the Mekong River about 100 kilometers um, from Phnom Penh, uh, sorry, from Phnom Penh, the capital city. Uh, and the whole point is to kind of identify different business opportunities. Now, a common thread that keeps coming up during the discussion with the villagers is that there's lots of bamboo growing in the village. It's abundant. It's growing in the village. It's surrounding it. Um, and it's used for various things as um, scaffolding, as uh, um, you know, uh, building material, and trellises for vegetable growing. So the ideas were discussed that, well, if this natural resource is so abundant, what else can we do with it? So the idea then came, up, came about saying, well, maybe we can 
set up a training to train villagers to create some bamboo furniture. Um, it seems like a viable and you know, favorable option. So as a result, the NGO then uh, developed this three-day workshop um, on furniture making to, op to offer to the villagers. However, the efforts were ultimately um, ill-fated. Not only was it difficult for the villagers to attend, to take time out of their daily life to attend a three-day workshop, um, there was also fundamentally something wrong with the idea of using the bamboo resource. Why it is so? So, for several, re for several years, the villagers have been gaining supplemental income by cutting bamboo into barbecue skewers, uh, and it was used by street food vendors in the nearby town. They would earn 5,000 reals, which is $1.25, um, by performing four to five hours of manual work, but usually done by women in around chores. So, in a way, um, actually observing this practice led the lead researcher to think, actually, you know, maybe we can leverage on this and, and make them um, generate more income. But actually, although the monthly returns on the hours spent is not very high, it was proven to be a very dependable income. Um, and I'll tell you why. So the beef sticks is what they call, the villagers call them, um, is sold to a middleman who comes every week to collect the sticks from the, the women. And in a way, they function as a basic safety net for the women because they don't have a very secure welfare system. So, for example, it's often relied on as a, as, a, as a kind of fallback. So if, for example, there was a young garment worker who um, lost a job in a factory, and the first thing the family did was actually went to make um, these beef steaks. Now, this safety net is also embedded in customer hi customary hierarchy. So the middleman that they sell the beef sticks to is also relied on as an informal social support. So when there's a festival or when the family is, needs a bit of money advance, they will, the beef stick middleman will offer some money advance to them in, in kind uh, and based on you know, future skewer production. So they became, they've become the kind of informal social safety net for the families. Um, this kind of advance called banda in vernacular Khmer language depends on an iteratively proven relationship of trust between both parties. So, in summary, from a very capitalist framing, the beef sticks doesn't look like they make a lot of money, but actually it's a very important social structure embedded in the fabric of the relationship between the, the villagers and the middlemen. So in the infrastructure in this case, obviously you have the natural resources, the bamboo, where it's growing in the compounds of each houses, the women making the stakes, the middlemen, and all the other villages. And these pre-existing relationships could be threatened if they actually, the furniture enterprise went ahead. You know, they would be chopping up more bamboo. Um, the bamboo are not just growing in, in uh, shared land, it's growing in people's residence. So there is sort of a personal, uh, you know, it's not really shared public land. So again, um, despite the well-intentioned approach taken by the team, they failed to kind of see these really embedded relational hierarchy that is there um, that could have been threatened had the enterprise went ahead. And this is despite them, you know, knowing them very well. So this example offers a stark, sorry, stark um, warning of an unintended consequence when attempting to intervene in a complex social cultural systems. And I think as designers, you know, we need to pay heed to these pre-existing ties, tacit agreements, obligations, and understand that they role, the role they play as a social glue before even entering into a system. Um, and in this case, it was also important to step back to not designers in this case. So designers, we always brought in to kind of create and innovate but in this case, it doesn't really, um, wasn't that uh, appropriate. So it brings me to my next question, which is, what does it mean to design responsibly, ethically, and respectful in these spaces? And at this point, I want to share some of my personal reflections on how myself and with other colleagues attempted to keep this question at the forefront of our practice. 
And I think the word entangled came up a few times this morning, um, and it basically is to, to, to recognize as designers, we are entering into this system of pre-existing social material relationships. When we enter, we have to engage with these relationships. Not all of them, because it'll be impossible, but we need to be in it. And we often then also accept that we become entangled into it and become part of the system, at least for a time being. So we then become part of the system. And the entanglement is important because, again, you can't be um, just being an outsider coming in. And recognizing that we are part of a system requires then a different set of sensitivities and practices and ethics as well in our designing. And for me personally, this then becomes no separation between the self and other nature culture and myself as a professional designer or a participant. So how does this mindset shift out in practice? And I'd like to share an example now from uh, an ongoing piece of work that I've done with colleagues from RMIT, Bangkok University, Kanazawa College of Art and Design in Japan. And it's based on a mentoring program that supports women craftspeople. We know that women creatives, entrepreneurs, and innovators play a role in driving innovation and supporting social cohesion. And since 2015, in this network that we've set up, we've been working with creative practitioners, working in social innovation in Asia Pacific, listening to their stories and learning from them. Alongside stories of success and resilience, we also hear the challenges that they face in their lives, such as limited opportunities for their personal and professional development. So in response, this is, and this is during COVID, we had a bit of money left over from other, other projects. We started a, we piloted a four month mentoring program in 2021. Uh, we supported 19 women across countries, sectors, cultures in Asia Pacific. And in 2022-23, we uh, received further funding from the Australian Japan government and from the UK government into an 18 month longer program to supporting women. We scaled it to 39 participants um, and we uh, involve participants from Australia, Japan, Malaysia and Thailand. So what you can see here is how they are clustered. Um, uh, they are grouped in uh, peer mentoring group, so we have a mentor with two or three mentees. They are put in the mentoring circle. They are supported by the project team, but we also have advisory boards as well as guest mentors. I would say that our approach can be described as very relationally and very culturally sensitive transcultural peer mentoring program. And it builds and nurtures relationships to create networks of support for women. Um, and support for these women really involves a number of things. Um, but essentially, it's really just to facilitate, guide, listen, encourage, nurture, inspire, and sometimes offer some direction. But it's really not a set program. So everyone has their own way of setting their direction. Now, our approach is very much based on pre-existing deep relationships that we have with the mentors, the starting point. So, our invitation to them as mentors meant that they were invited into conditions of trust and care, and that signaled to the mentors that, that we were inviting them to extend that condition to their mentees. And we've learned from our previous pilot program how important these foundational qualities are to create an atmosphere of kindness, generosity, and care in these networks of support. And by building relationships through familiar, personal ways of connecting underpinned by trust, respect, connection, and understanding, we then um, obviously need to start doing that in a way that makes sense to them. Being Malaysian, I love my food, and being Asian, we have, and, and I think food is a, is a great way to bring people together. So we always start any gathering with uh, food, a meal around the table because it, it offers a familiar and personal ways of connecting. Um, and in many, many cultures, social rituals like sharing a meal plays an important part in building connections and relationships and to, to learn more about each other in a convivial atmosphere. And because we were physically unable to bring the women together at the start of the program, this was during uh, COVID-19 travel restrictions, 
we had to consider other ways in which we could connect these women, because it was all online relationships to start with. One of the key practices that we introduced was what we call a gift exchange. So what does that mean? So a gift exchange, uh, the initial gifts, so as we as project teams, we bought some small gifts. Um, they were consistent of teas and snacks that we had as a, as in our country or as a childhood memory with our backgrounds and location. We then met online to enjoy these teas and snacks, you can see on the left side, and share and just get to know each other convivially. And after this gift exchange, we also encouraged the mentors and mentees to share gifts, sometimes personal gifts or sometimes gifts that represent their own creative practice, or some of them were curators as well, some of them were artists, some of them were social entrepreneurs. It then helped build a connectedness to what they do, but also commitments and illustrates kind of deepening of relationships. And first, this gift exchange sort of happened throughout the whole program, not just at the start. And support for these women happened over time in different ways. So the mentoring group devised their own rhythms and ways of mentoring and connecting online that suited their own work and their life situation. Some of the mentoring groups began to collaborate. What you can see on the left side is a film that was done by a mentor and, to, and her mentees to illustrate their conception of what mentoring is, bringing into play their creative practice. Uh, our role as project team was really to support these group-led arrangements. We met for impromptu coffees and picnics if we're in the city. Uh, we did some craft together. Um, we also did do some formal um, content support, I guess. We invited guest speakers to share their own experiences around work-life balances, for example, or starting their own business. But essentially, we didn't have a curriculum to start with. We didn't say we had set content we needed to deliver to these women. We basically premised everything on making sure we had the right mentors and right mentees in and putting into groups and creating an atmosphere that they can develop longer-term relationships to find support. When COVID-19 risk lowered and travel restriction eased, we met in Bangkok for a face-to-face -face event, and after nearly meeting a year of meeting online, um, this reunion became an Im important milestone for us celebrating, crystallizing and reflecting what it meant to have learned and achieved together. In terms of impact felt, um, these are some of the uh, their words, I guess, they, they felt looked after, so we tried to center the participants' experiences towards building good relationships, starting with the experience of joining and the practice of giving gifts. Um, we wanted them to feel care and generosity in their mentoring experience, and we tried to listen to their feelings and make collective decisions with openness and transparency. I feel seen, recognizing where each person is at, um, helps us respect and respond to their everyday realities. Um, and we, we mentioned not having preset content so they can find their own way in their own time. And they didn't feel alone. They found um, allyship with their peers and feeling safe and supported allow the participants to connect with others who share their values. And also recognize the differences. Not only were they from different countries, different sectors, but very different life experience as well. So how were we attentive to pre-existing relationships, networks, power, knowledge, values, and practices? So circling back to this idea of infrastructure, I also want to introduce the term infrastructure. It's not my term, but it's you know, a term that is being extended. So a um, number of scholars extended the notion of infrastructure and highlights the long-term perspective in developing strategies, processes, and practices of an effective infrastructure. What that means is, as a, as a co-designing process, we need to think about the emergence of new practices, i.e. designing for when the design is completed, for when you as a designer exit that system. So what happens then? So in a sense, mentoring was created on pre-existing ties that had trust, care, generosity, openness, and it's about passing that relationship to others. So new relationships grew from that. We know that uh, the networks that was brought in by the mentors, with in the mentees in the mentors, allowed uh, burgeoning new relationships. I know even some of the mentees used the bursary money to help uh, pay for English classes for their own community. So things that we recognize, so demonstrates sort of tangible, intangible flows through these relationships. 
We also did things, uh, we, we relied on cultural practices and cultural memories. So we started using the term aunties and nieces uh, in how, we, how we, ad we, we address the mentors and mentees. Just because, well, certainly in Southeast Asian cultures, it's used, auntie and uncles used as a friendly honorific to someone older, but not necessarily someone with blood ties. So again, this refers to more familial kin-like relationships that could evoke warmth, affection, um, that goes beyond the kind of formal term of mentor and mentee. And again, calling on the cultural memory muscles of community and kinship groups. We were also working with respect, with hierarchies through respect. What that means is that we were cognizant of there's always power asymmetry in any mentoring relationships. In a way, that's the whole point. You, you want to learn from someone who has more knowledge or more experience. Um, but instead of aiming to remove or reduce the power hierarchy, we worked with it by foregrounding respect. So power is dynamic, dynamically distributed and not something that one can give up by choice. For example, any one of us here, we can't erase our age, our ethnicity, our knowledge and years, and ignore the senior roles that we might be performing in our organization and community. So working with existing and expected power structures allowed us to work productively with hierarchy while offering a safe environment for women, women to share and to speak out. So in summary, our approach has been to design respectfully to consider existing cultural norms, practices and values and behaviors, and how can we leverage sort of cultural memory and practices to make it familiar and safe to community. We were also designing with what's already present. So drawing on the installed base, uh, pre-existing and thick trust from the mentors and how we were able to invite them into this trusting relationship and then trusting them to pass on that care and generosity to their own mentees. And our aim is not to overly disrupt or overly challenge the mentees' worldviews. We design with care as well as do things carefully, respecting where they're at. And our aim is not to disrupt, and it's often the case when design is being brought in or deployed, but rather to offer support in a subtle, safe, and trusted way. And recognizing that we are entangled in a complex system that has pre-existing relational ties means that we have to act respectfully and sensitively with care. So I guess my parting question to everyone is, how might you do so in your own practice? That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, we've got some time for questions, if you've got any. Uh, just put up your hand and uh, we can get to you with a microphone. <laughs> uh, it, uh, uh, we were just discussing, sorry. So, so I'm into um, a, a course where we kind of compare uh, and see differences and overlap between action research and design research. Mm -hmm. And I think you are a perfect example of something in the middle. Do you agree? <laughs> and, and can you elaborate on that? Um, yeah, I guess our approach has been in influenced by a number of, I mean, there's a feminist lens to it. There's a um, learning by doing lens. Um, and we're always, and there's a, there's a kind of ecosystem lens to it. Um, and there's a participatory design. So infrastructures is strongly theorized and used in participatory design circles and academic circles. So um, yeah, I guess what we do is always in the field and it's, and what, we, what I didn't share is that we, we have a reflective framework that we had where we were using every time we were meeting as a project team to make sure that we were forefronting these questions, question of power, hierarchy, actions, decisions, et cetera. And that changed over, you know, over the period of 18 months. So rather than just being um, consumed by the pragmatics of delivering the program, we were also, and, and, we, we, and that was why it was like, very exhausting because we were having to adapt and change. And, and sometimes the mentoring relationships didn't always work, so we also had to find out, like, do we intervene, do we not, do we let it play out, and uh, do we trust, of course we trust the mentees, mentors to do what they need to do, but sometimes if it's just 
pragmatics. So um, it is action all the time, it's learning all the time, it's reflecting all the time. So yeah, it's just hard work. <laughs> Hi, thank you Hi. so much. I had a question. I'm going to formulate it in like a really brief sentence. And if you need more information, tell me. Sure. I was wondering if you see any epistemic downsides to like the familiarity of this approach. So everyone getting to know each other really well. Yeah, so we had an example from the pilot program where we introduced the auntie and niece use. And of course, one, um, one of the mentors brought up they weren't very comfortable with that because it had it has gender connotation, gender expectations. So I think there's always going to be um, the other side of the coin, but we were aware of that. And what we did in the, in the second iteration was we offered that up, um, but we also encouraged uh, all the groups and team members to negotiate what the, rela what the relationship they want to have with the men mentors and mentees. Some wanted a bit more direction, some wanted a little bit more sisterly, but less formal, some, you know. So I think what we then did as, I guess, to infrastructure that discussion to happen was when we met together as a group, we tried to have these, even just con concepts of, it was kind of framed around leadership, but even concepts of leadership and mentoring is so disputed and discounted and, you know, for the Japanese mentees, leadership, um, leadership sounded really scary and it's all men and patriarchy, right? So we were conscious we were using those terms, but we also wanted and tried to encourage each group or each person to um, address that and in their own context and to be what they're comfortable with. Thank you. Um, I'm sitting here both as, an, as a researcher, but in this case, my, my question is, I think as a practitioner um, in, in a change in, in education, in my case, and that is that I, I'm so, I'm, I'm far, very much always aware, maybe n not even enough, but aware of this this um, complex system that you come in and that you you feel that something needs to be changed and i i wondered when i heard your story okay so to what point uh, you you feel that you take everything into account yeah but when you're there in the middle taking everything into account how can you then still make a change because then it's all so logical as it is uh, that was the, yeah. the struggle that I felt in your story. I think. I think. The, I think the struggle is you'll never be able to take everything into account, mm -hmm. but I think you need to at least be sensitized enough to take some of it more. I think the, the problem I had with training as a designer, you, you, we talk about oh, it's all about context, but not really. You go in and with your tools and methods and processes, and you go in running a workshop thinking everyone understands what it is. Well, not really. Um, so I think it's. For me as an identity and my training as a designer is to bring in those other sensitivities that I feel myself in design education is lacking. And I'm guilty of that because I teach students. But it's, it's, I think it's just for everyone to, to consider in themselves and in their own practices, in their own lens um, and in their own sensibility. We, we have a very particular way of doing things. And also I think to certain extent very not that I want to culturally stereotype an Asian way of doing things. You know, we talk about power, and the reason why we bring that up is, you know, hierarchy is really important. It's, it's part of the culture that is not about, if you go into any code design theory, you know, it's all about, oh, trying to leverage works, you know, trying to reduce the power dynamics. It's, it, the power dynamics is always there, but it's when it's, in, when it's causing harm. That it's, so, but, but actually, it is, really, it is really helpful to have that power dynamics because, um, People can learn from it, they respect, and, and it, all the micro interactions happen non verbally. Um, and even just simple things like honorifics. The Japanese who have different honorifics to address someone who they don't know yet, the Thai had it. And me as a Malaysian, I, you know, trying to address someone who's Thai and trying to know which honorifics to, to use is a, is a minefield. But at least I'm aware because it is important to reflect that respect. But, you know, they don't teach us, they don't teach us that in design education, not in mine 30 years ago, 20 years ago. So. Any more questions?
stun them into silence. Yeah, that's yeah, so way until a uh, question arises. Now, yeah. thank you very much. Uh, we've got some uh, nice Dutch oh. treat for you and handmade soap. Thank you. Um, and thanks a thank lot. You. Thanks very much. Give thank it up for Joyce. Thank you. I wasn't aware that it's apparently a stereotype that designers are smelly and that's why we give them yes. all soap, but um, <laughs> here we are. Uh, now, we have a panel on how universities can be linked to societal transition challenges. And for this, I'd like to welcome the following three experts from the Erasmus University Rotterdam, who are all leaders in the field of sustainability and connected to the design impact transition, also known as DIT platform. Uh, first of all, we've got Anna Vasquez, uh, Erasmus University College lecturer and ecologist and a sustainability scientist whose main focus is on the underlying processes that drive nature's resilience and the role of human actions therein. Welcome, Anna. Next up, we have Ginny Servant Miklos, an educator, researcher, and activist currently working as an assistant professor in the Department of Clinical Psychology at the Erasmus School of Social Behavioral Sciences. Give it up for Ginny. And last but not least, we got Sanne Kufut, senior lecturer in intersectional studies of media and culture at the Erasmus University Rotterdam. And she's connected to this as a researcher in transformative repair. We had a panel yesterday uh, ran by uh, Remco, amongst others, who uh, stressed that he hates panels. So uh, in order to spite him, we'll try to make this as boring as possible. Um, also good to know there will be some time uh, for questions uh, from the audience, so pay attention. Um, Anna, to start off with, uh, what can you tell us about the story of this? Uh, first of all, thanks for the invitation to be here. I'm very glad to be here. I'll try to make it boring. <laughs> so, <laughs> history is always a good start point. Yeah, so I think it's hard to pinpoint the start of it because something like a design impact transition platform that aims to connect different faculties and also the outside world of the university, it's kind of alive in many places before it comes to a start. But I would say that... Um, in the process, at least in relation to education, uh, what happened is that we had a working group on sustainability in education. And um, that, ki that came from an effort from students and staff at faculty council and also at uh, university council, etc., and somehow managed to have it within the strategy of the university. So we had um, several com conversations with um, representatives of the different faculties in which we really wanted to find spaces in between our own disciplines. Um, and from that came like a very boring document that uh, is actually <laughs> available online, <laughs> where we have like the status of what's going on at the university and what we need to, to, come for, to go forward. Um, and well, the step that we needed to take was actually design impact transition platform. Um, why? Because we could connect faculties better. At this moment we have, for instance, we are DIT academics, so that means that we get uh, a space at the design impact transition platform alongside our current job at our own faculties. So we get to work together in a sort of mixed way. And that was one thing that came from that document. And another thing is that we needed to start experimenting with different types of education. Uh, and we'll talk about more about those experimenting aspects later, but yeah. Yeah, um, so this is all happening within the university. Uh, Ginny, what can you tell us about the work you do outside? Of the, uh, the university is a wonderful place to, um, especially did within the university, is a wonderful place for this kind of transformational thinking, but there are also some limitations to working within a university in that Ultimately, we're bound by the rigidities that are inherent in university work, including disciplinary divisions, 
um, including that assessment drives the learning right and assessment is also having to conform to certain accreditation requirements. So if you want to really radically break free from that, then you do have to create spaces outside of the university uh, to create those transitions. And that's really where I bring in my background as I, I have 15 years of experience as a community activist um, in communities from, from my own uh, home communities to I work a lot with communities in, in Southern Africa and in India. And I'm bringing that experience back into Rotterdam um, working, for instance, with the Giovanni van Bronckers Foundation to create emotional resilience programs for children from uh, disfavored socioeconomic backgrounds. Uh, so those are primary school kids. Um, and I'm also working on um, developing a Volkshochschool, uh, which will be a, a transition school that is non-formal, that welcomes HBO, uh, MBO, and VO students together to learn practical and theoretical skills for transitions. And that cannot really happen within a university. That's why we're taking it outside the university, but connecting it in as like a liminal space between the MBOs, HBOs, and university within Rotterdam. Very innovative, for sure, yeah. Um, Sana, what are some of the challenges that you face when moving transformative interventions from the margins of the university to other places? Um, well, before, before I answer that question, I think it's important to mention that those marginal spaces are really important for the development of such transformative practices. So. Um, the term margins has, I think, a, also a somewhat negative connotation, right? It's that which will always be somewhat at the edges. But um, <laughs> together with Anna, uh, we've been working on the, uh, the, or with the metaphor of ecotones, right? Which are ecological zones where two ecosystems come together. And they're actually particularly productive. Um, um, lots of new species uh, emerge there from those unexpected connections. And institutions, um, institutional margins, I think, can also, under the right circumstances, become such ecotones for the emergence of new, uh, uh, potentially transformative practices. Uh, and that's really great. We have, for instance, uh, connected to Erasmus University College, um, the Razzle program, uh, which, is, uh, um, which engages transdisciplinary learning and teaching between the arts and sciences. Uh, we have, of course, the DIT platform, which also uh, creates these, yeah, let's say, sort of the cracks within the institutions where all kinds of great, um, colorful, mossy <laughs> things can grow uh, uh, and expand. Um, but uh, indeed, the, the, the challenge then is how to bring that back into the uh, uh, institutional, uh, let's say, the, the conventional or, or, or sort of central uh, institutional practices as well. Um, yeah, one example is uh, um, both uh, I and oh, well, I and some colleagues of mine have been working on uh, um, transformative assessment methods, right? So trying to uh, rethink assessment, for instance, through uh, co-creation, right? Co-creating assessment methods with students. Um, or I've been working on transformative repair as um, um, a model for assessment where moments of failure um, are not sort of hidden away. So like the recent assignment isn't like rewrite the paper into the paper it should have been, but to really um, work with the failure, through the failure, keep that visible somehow to also um, learn about let's say the way in which failure is somehow uh, fundamental and intertwined in all types of uh, uh, learning. Um, but then you immediately run into the problem indeed of um, well, the demands of accreditation committees or uh, academic rules and regulations that stipulate that a research assignment cannot test anything else beyond what was tested in the original assignment. So as soon as you add something to that, uh, you run into a problem. That means that instead of proposing this um, experiment with uh, a different type of research assessment, I now actually feel almost forced to design an entire and propose an entire new course <laughs> where the assignment then uh, in the center of the course uh, is sort of set up in a way that failure is, uh, um, yeah, uh, th that, that failure is going to happen anyway. And then it's like you have a sort of weird artificial reset at the end. So it's really challenging, I think, to propose something new within the frameworks of the existing, yeah. yeah. Um, Anna, what kind of spaces do we need for transformative interventions? Yeah, I think to build up on that, um, so that's the biggest challenge is to, because these spaces, they are open, 
So the acknowledgement of this openness and let's say mutual beneficial interaction between the space and the people working in the space, right? In which uh, space is not seen as a resource for competition, but is seen mm. as uh, an open space for co-creating more complexity, for co-creating different niches, uh, different possibilities, etc. Um, that can work quite well if there is an acknowledgement and if there is a space created, but then indeed, like how do we bring that in and how do we bring that forward? I think that's, that's the main challenge, also not only to bring that to another scale, but also to keep having it or existing, because these are all transitional spaces with lots of people that come in and out and precarious conditions often, etc. so yeah. Right. Um, Ginny, in preparation of this uh, roundtable, I talked to Anna and uh, Sana about the so-called dual approach, in which you develop a critical voice from the margins, while at the same time expanding the margins. Can you give us some examples of that from your work? Yeah, so it's really important when... Um, we've, we've learned from history in the past that critical voices are very important, but... Um, we've been struggling with critical movements that are not able to uh, connect back into a system to create transformational change. So if you get yourself into a situation when you are a perpetual force of opposition without the capacity to actually um, expand what is possible within the system, then short of all-out revolution, you're not going to get the kinds of transformations that you want. So it's a permanent exercise in frustration. Uh, and so... Some will say, well, then let's just have a revolution. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'm not, you know, being French, I'm not entirely averse to revolutions. <laughs> um, but at the moment where we're at, in the university spaces where we're at, it's important that we find a way that the voices that are critical within the university system are also participating in the transformations that are happening at the margins and progress also progressively um, like a Russian doll analogy of like working closer and closer with the center. Uh, and that means some of, we as academics then have to question our own identities because I know that some of us make a professional identity out of being perpetual critics. And so I hear rooms of recognition here. <laughs> uh, so it's really important that we look at ourselves and say, at what point and under what conditions are we willing to work with the system to help, for instance, uh, and I've been involved with the DIP platform in organizing sustainability dialogues across the entire university uh, in, in all the schools and three cross-school dialogues and uh, the first university climate summit in the Netherlands. And what that means is we have to work with students, with teachers, with deans, with the uh, executive board all across. And that there is a time to sit on the floor and occupy your university, and there is a time to say, now we have to work together and actually try and move transformative change. If that doesn't work, sure, I'll go back and sit on the floor of <laughs> the buildings in the university, but we have to, to make space for all approaches. That makes sense, yeah. Uh, Sonne, can you tell us more about the role and importance of open-ended speculation on one hand, and on the other hand, the strategic outcomes that you need in order to generate the resources for the product you actually want to do? Yeah, this is, I think, um, another story of this exercise in perpetual frustration, of <laughs> course. <laughs> All right. um, yes, so this space for emergence of radically new, potentially transformative uh, practices, uh, ideas, and knowledges, um, I think uh, um, relies on having this space for open-ended speculative uh, research and, and teaching. Um, it means that you have the space and the time and the inclination to uh, venture into yeah, a project where you don't yet know what the outcome will be, um, which is basically um, antithetical to how, um, uh, yeah, basically funding for research mm -hmm. and also how uh, career development in academic institutions works, right? So basically, you get uh, closer and closer to the center of institutional power by uh, 
mostly writing uh, proposals in which you promise way in advance what the outcome of your work will be, right? Um, uh, the question is, of course, uh, how much space there is for anything uh, transformative or new to emerge from that, which is not to say that nothing good comes out of it, right? So that, can, that does yield qualitatively um, good uh, research and teaching as well. Um, but it doesn't leave a lot of space for uh, uh, something new to, to, to be imagined uh, and, and come into being. Um, and so there is this, um, let's say, added challenge, I think, of learning to, to speak two different languages, um, learning to uh, uh, yeah, navigate a space in two different ways, or learning to um, draw the map while at the same time uh, keeping your sort of adventuring um, uh, inclinations intact, that is really quite difficult, I think, right? So, so, so if you have to be simultaneously uh, the critic but also remain open for mm -hmm. negotiation, uh, on the other hand, you have to be simultaneously, um, yeah, this, uh, uh, let's say, adventurous, uh, uh, open-minded uh, um, person while at the same time um, performing sort of strategic uh, future uh, <laughs> planning. <laughs> and so, you know, that's like, that's only two of the challenges. <laughs> I'm sure your next question will bring us uh, some more. Yeah, I was wondering, um, Anna and uh, Ginny, if you agree on what your perspective is uh, on those kind of problems or challenges, I should call them. <laughs> so, two years ago, I quit my research career for that reason. <laughs> um, in that I felt that I was busy writing my Veni proposal, for which is one of the biggest postdoctoral research grants, and I had the interview lined up, so I was all the way in the final, and then I decided I'm not going to the interview, because I thought this is pointless. I'm, I was working with Razzle, and I, the whole point of Razzle <laughs> is that we don't <laughs> predict in advance what the outcomes are going to be, and here I am writing a proposal about what in four years' time I'm going yeah. to be able to publish in academic journals, and I thought this is really pointless. Um, and I would have left academia, but I do see some transformations happening there. The reason I'm still in academia is because at Erasmus University, there is now a pilot to give people like myself a career on the basis of societal impact. And so I'm one of the guinea pigs of, my, of the <laughs> School of Social and Behavioral Sciences as an impact career track academic, where my uh, career progression does not depend on how much I publish or how much I teach, but rather how many societally impactful projects I uh, participate in and how I can, because it is a pioneering position, I'm also in the process of helping the university define impact. And that's quite an exciting place to be. So it's not perfect. Um, it's still relies on this kind of, like who gets to define what p positive societal impact is. Ultimately, that is driven by the strategic agenda that is determined from uh, top down. So there's still a power hierarchy there that, you know, me, myself, I'm not gonna be able to challenge that on my own. But I do feel like with all these crises swirling around us, the university is slowly waking up to the fact that we need to start thinking differently and it's slow. It's not perfect, it's full of hiccups, um, but I do feel like it is a better place than even 10 years ago in terms of the options that we have to do something different. Right, and you said uh, you're now in a process of defining the impact, can you expand a little bit on that? Well, for instance, um, at universities every year you have to write this like personal profile or narrative for your career development, <laughs> and I go to my manager, I'm like, so what does that look like for an impact track? And they're like, <laughs> We don't know. <laughs> Try something, and then we'll <laughs> see if like we can maybe use that. And then somebody else from a different school, from the Rotterdam School of Management, contacts me like, "Oh, can you just share with us what you wrote? Because <laughs> we we're, we're really interested in implementing that." So it's like these informal discussions where you kind of create something, and then that inspires other people to. Um, there's like a broad strategic definition of what societal impact is at the central level, and then there is space at the level of the academics to define what that means concretely, for instance, for an assistant professor position. Um, and I appreciate that it depends on your manager and how flexible they are, <laughs> and it depends on the faculty that you're in, but I personally feel like I would not still be in academia if I didn't feel like I had the options, the freedom to do things that really matter in these times of transitions. 
Right, right. Um, Anna, what is your perspective on this? Yeah, so I fully share the perspective. Um, uh, and also, I think that it's good to bring up that this is a privilege, right? Because mm. we can afford that we are all from background Erasmus University College, that actually is very much connected to teaching. So that gives us a more or less stable position to be able to try out these new things and negotiate these new things. This is not granted everywhere. So that's, I think, a very important thing to keep in mind. And, and also, um, connecting to what you said about this definition of impact, um, there's, there are so many spaces to work in these things because sometimes we might feel paralyzed by, oh, this is what they expect from me. But actually, there might not be an actual definition from it. So there's a lot of room to work on those things as well. Yeah? I see. Um, before we move on to questions from the audience, is there any questions I haven't asked you yet that you would like to answer? <laughs> <laughs> you can't say no. <laughs> uh, does anyone have a question yet? I think we've uh, shared some of the perspectives we have, different ones. Do you happen to have a question for the audience? Maybe that's an interesting one as well. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Thanks, and I empathize myself also as a tenure tracker that, that it's really, really constraining. The, and there are a lot of fields in which this vary. So maybe I have a double question. One is, um, do you see some fields that have um, better practices from which we can learn from? Because just to give you a very quick thought, um, I know in business school, for example, there is now a movement of we should have more impact. And yesterday I was tried by the keynote that said, if we don't do research, nothing change in the medical field, because in the medical field, you really need to have research to change anything, whereas we see that managers don't look at research, for example. Uh, but the other is, um, I appreciate also the comment of, um, you know, we have to have those informal discussions to influence and to impact each other. Um, are you doing something to really bring the uh, message also outside the Netherlands? Because I do think that the Dutch is a very privileged um, context as well, because now there is a lot of experimentation in having tenure track that are more impact driven, uh, whereas other countries, and if you have to be mobile, it's really, it's really challenging. So I just wonder if you can give your perspective on this too. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's a great question. And I do, um, I do think that the fact that my background is in gender studies um, has equip me with at least some kind of working model or some propositions, right, for how to work on a transition within institutions through, let's say, a sort of double uh, attack. Um, gender studies, of course, came from um, a feminist movement, um, was always or first of all, I think, impact-driven, right? Uh, and therefore, uh, from the very beginning in, in, in its conversations about, well, what gender studies then should be or should become, um, very quickly acknowledged the importance, first of all, of the mainstreaming of feminist, uh, the feminist critique of disciplinary academic practices. Um, and you see the effect of that right now. I mean, um, no. Uh, a course on literature where the last week deals with, you know, stuff women have, have written, books women have written, mm -hmm. is not great. But in any case, you can no longer get away uh, with not doing, at, at the very least, that. Um, on the other hand, it's been um, for um, um, many gender studies scholars uh, and teachers, um, been very important to maintain this space of gender studies in between at, or at the margins of various disciplines, so often located somewhat um, comfortably or uncomfortably uh, somewhere in the vicinity of the humanities or somewhere in the vicinity of uh, social sciences, right? Um, to maintain its uh, institutional place there um, because those spaces, uh, because they are at the margin, leave more space for the type of transformative um, academic research and also uh, transformative feminist, anti-racist, queer uh, teaching that would not uh, so readily and also still is not really that uh, easily uh, integrated within more traditional disciplinary uh, research and teaching. So I think this is um, 
uh, an example that, that we can still learn from, also because it's still an ongoing debate, right? 30, uh, 40 years later. Um, it's, a, it's a point of constant reflection uh, of what is the location of gender studies in relation to its institutions and its history of institutionalization. Is that still sufficient for the work it needs to do and wants to do in the future? And what does that mean for the way in which we practice both research and teaching always in relation or entangled with uh, the institutions that we, uh, that we work at, yeah. Great question, thank you. Uh, one over here, two over here. Um, hey, thanks for the yeah, very interesting uh, panel discussion. It wasn't boring at all. <laughs> um, so I would like to invite you to talk a bit more about impact and what it means to you. Um, we, we touched upon it in several ways, but we've also been circling around a bit on what impact actually means. Um, and especially, so perhaps you agree with me that there seems to be somewhat of an, let's say, an impact wave going through the university. So both in ed education should become more impactful, or research should be more impactful. And slowly, as you beautifully described, you have the opportunity yourself, it's becoming increasingly possible to shape your own career around societal impact. So what are the, like, the beautiful horizons, but also perhaps the dark sides or the risks of positioning impacts increasingly centrally in how we approach academia. What do you see happening? What do you think about that? Yeah, so this was one of the key topics under discussion when we um, tried to shape the sustainability dialogues at the university. Um, because impact like sustainability is one of these words that can mean anything and everything. Um, and when you see positive societal impact plastered, it's literally like written across the bridge <laughs> at Erasmus University, so you can't miss it. And then you ask the uh, rector, yeah, uh, what does that actually mean? <laughs> um, it's very easy for this to become impact washing. Um, and to say, like for instance, if you as, uh, our university was going in the direction of measuring impact with a SDG dashboard. Um, it doesn't take a critical genius to work out <laughs> that that can easily be manipulated in ways that work counter to actually creating the kinds of transformations we need to, um, well, at the risk of sounding a little cynical, to survive as a species in the society. Um, and you can see that, you know, we have one of the biggest if not the biggest business school in the Netherlands at Erasmus University, and uh, they're all over this. <laughs> you know, business schools and impacts, like, we have SDGs, we're doing so good, it's so, we're doing great. Um, I think what the DIT platform allows us to do is have to, like, be that voice on the shoulder of the university to go, well, this is not good enough. And I think it's great that it's the DIT platform that has the responsibility for coordinating these dialogues, because then we can, uh, shape that discussion in a way that doesn't allow these easy escapes. Uh, of course, we can't, uh, there will always be that temptation, and so long as the SDGs contain, for instance, goal eight, which is economic growth, then anybody in any business school around the world can go, we're doing economic growth, we're doing SDGs, <laughs> uh, without critically reflecting about, yeah, but if you're doing economic growth, what about climate change? What about biodiversity? What about the oceans? Uh, so, it's fraught with problems, but I am glad that we have critical places like Razzle, like the DIP platform, um, and that they do actually invite people like me who are on an impact track to contribute to that in a more critical way. So we're not letting the, the board get away with just uh, uh, saying impact and not doing impact. Uh, and if you're asking for my definition of impact, um, well, I'm very existentialist in that regard. Um, <laughs> that's just what I do. I'm French again, as I said. <laughs> um, I look at in what ways are we contributing to increasing the personal resilience and collective resilience of the societies that we live in towards what is already here and what's coming. Um, and we're not we're not doing enough of that. The way we define impact at the moment is not up to the challenge of what's coming for us. Good question, thank you. There was, yeah, another question over there. Thank you, thanks. Um, I, one of the things that um, often with systems, people talk about kind of, is it better to try to change the systems we're in or is it better to 
essentially create a new system or just mm. bypass it. And it sounds like you know you've you've talked about some like all of you talked about some amazing like the amount of work you've put in to trying to change and reform and redirect the systems you're in. But do you think and it's clearly frustrating to some extent and successful in other ways, but do you think actually we just need some new models of universities. We need to create some new systems where we ditch a lot of the stuff that we don't need and we focus on things that actually we perhaps as you know, researchers interested mm -hmm. in, in systems and in complexities of society, we can focus on them. Or is that too naive to say, well, actually just make a new system? Visible mending, maybe? Sun, huh? when to go? <laughs> um, yeah. Um, of course, when I am frustrated at home <laughs> at night, this is what I've said many times to my partner. I'm just going to quit my job and start another university <laughs> and do away with all this bullshit. Um, but uh, I think there are some issues with that. Uh -huh. so first of all, is th 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 this is, I think, what my entire research project is about. I'm a huge proponent of mending what we have. We don't have infinite resources to make new things. Um, and I also um, think that it's good to be somewhat hesitant about um, falling into the idea or biting into the ideological connotations of the new as being better. Um, instead, um, I think there is much to be said for trying to repair, and that's, uh, I'm really inspired by this sort of DIY punk visible mending community, right? So to, so to repair the institutions that we have, uh, ideally in some visible way, in some way that also leaves intact the problematic histories that uh, we are all entangled in as well, um, as a way to move on, but also to, to not uh, sweep to the side also the significant amount of energy and resources that are already in those institutions, but also the immense amount of, of power, and not only in the sense of oppressive power, but also potentializing power that these institutions have by the very way of their being networked together, right? Um, I think that uh, a sort of reparative disposition towards institutions um, possibly is a better way to uh, work with uh, already present resources and materials and histories and practices and people and etc. Great question, thank you. One over there. Yep. Uh, it's again on impact, sorry. Um, I, I, just, I was just reminded of this conversation I had with one of my students. I teach in an art school. Uh, and designers, there they get the question, become the designer that you want to be. It's also a massive question. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and this whole new generation is all about impact. It's the only thing they think about. And we're trying to constantly figure out how can we get them to make the problem smaller so they can actually contribute. Mm -hmm. And I had this discussion with a student, like where do we fail as, as, as teachers? How, how can we help you to do this? Where did we where did we ask this question that you make it so big? And she was saying, like, it's not you, it's like society is demanding us to be all about impact. It's about the world, it's about the universe. That's like the big question. So that, to me, I was like, where do we maybe as universities or as art schools have the responsibility to actually make impact tangible for our students? And then we have thousands of students working on tangible little bits of impact generating massive growth. I don't know if it's... I was wondering how you think about this. Can we talk about maybe intersection between education and research here, I feel? Um, I don't know if it answers your question, but we have also this kind of uh, questions, for instance, um, in the programs that we teach, uh, in which students do real projects and they go out there and they interview people and et cetera, right? And, and, and the idea is that they start as a student eventually, but they end up as, maybe a little bit, but not a full, but a um, little action researcher, as l at, at least in their minds. So there is this kind of reciprocal interaction with their surroundings, and in principle, they should also bring something in, right? So we have these discussions about uh, what, what does it mean to go to the south of Rotterdam and, and interview people there, right? So then the south of Rotterdam becomes like, okay, everybody has to understand what's going on in the south of Rotterdam, people are living there and they're like, why do I get students every year and every time? <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> it's, it, it's 
sort of becomes also saturating, right, the, to a certain extent. So there needs to be not only a story in which we entangle research and education in a meaningful way, but also that students, by interacting with society, with their projects, can create impact, yes, uh, because they are creating impact in each interaction, right? When they mm. talk to someone, it's like, oh, but there is someone researching something that's happening on my street about composting. Oh, this is interesting. They come all the way from the university on the other side of the river, etc. So uh, this impact is being created. It's not like the level impact of like bullets, uh, silver bullets, whatever we have called it in the past, and that's not the impact we want to create. But um, we need to have more integration, I would say, between what does it mean to be a researcher, what is education role in this like research movement or being an action researcher. I don't know if you want to add. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, in, in this sense, um, I think it's very um, it's very tricky that um, we are using these metaphors of entanglement constantly, right? And of course, in research. Um, the focus often is on trying to find ways in order to get a better understanding of the larger web consisting of all these complex entanglements, right? But, but in teaching students who are beginning um, uh, their uh, career and beginning their um, yeah, development as, as, as critical thinkers, they can also get caught in that huge web of entanglements, right? And maybe in teaching, it's sometimes more important to also bring focus back to those micro relations, right? To the threads that they are already maintaining and holding onto. And, and that's where there is space to, to, to move and to change, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's also related to the way in which our neoliberal system of education co-opts mm -hmm. concepts. So uh, yeah. um, I, I wrote my PhD on the history of education, so I've like studied a lot how ideology has shaped education throughout the years. And what we see is around the 1990s, the discourse around education, uh, particularly in the Anglo-Saxon world, and then increasingly moving into the European Union, and you see this in European uh, directives on education moves towards self-directed learning and lifelong learning as the new. Uh, so it's like disconnect yourself from society, disconnect yourself from your communities, become this flexible cosmopolitan uh, international mm. English speaking students. Let's have all our courses in English. Let's uh, Bologna process. Let's strip all the complexities of your national degrees with like four or five years, everyone on the same model. And then financial crisis, climate crisis, COVID crisis, whoops. Uh, we need to do something different. I know, impact. Okay, so we're going to follow exactly the same model, except now we're not going to call it lifelong learning, we're going to call it impact. And then we're like, okay, students, off you go, impact, impact for us. Um, and, <laughs> and then students are like, uh, how do I do that? Um, and I feel, so I did a lot of, of research back in the day on how students experience this, how this was for them as a learning experience, and how it connected to their habitus as mostly middle class uh, Western European students. And that we saw that this then connected in with a sense of fear of missing out in the sense that they could not commit to anything. And I had this experience with your students in your minor, where they, so Anna has this brilliant minor that she coordinates with the DIT platform, and the students have to make impact projects, and I was on the jury for the, those, those projects, and at the end of the oral presentation, I asked students, oh, that's great, so what are you gonna do with this now? You know, like, you've created this template for action. They're like, oh, well, I got my grade, so I'll just move on to the next thing. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> yeah. uh, and I don't think it's the flaw in the design of the program or the minor, I just think it's this mindset of impact as becoming a part of the Western middle class habitus instead of becoming a transformative process. So somewhere it's got co-opted in the, in the like, hooks of the yeah. system and we need to like unhook it before we can really actuate its transformative potential. Yeah, because... Yeah, <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you for all your questions. Um, I'm afraid we failed at making this very boring, but despite that, we would like to give you some thank you presents. <laughs> Got some Dutch treats and um, handmade soap for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wow. Thank you. Okay.
after a short break, we'll have a round of workshops again. Uh, for those of you who were here this morning or yesterday, you know how this works. Uh, but just in case, um, you can see here the five workshops that will be there and where you need to be. You can get a ticket at the back of the room. And we'll see you back here at 15.50 sharp or at your workshop. <laughs>